night is gone and with the morning come a rays of hope that lead us on so we will strive to give our children a brighter day where they My name is Tanya uh, Shashu, the V uh, external for the committee. Uh, in this moment, uh, allow me to take you take this opportunity to hand over to Michelle, who will take us through our mini game that we have to go through this night, this afternoon. Sorry, uh, it's called How Zimbabwe Are You? Over to you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you all for joining us today. So my name is Michelle Musa and I am doing my second year law degree. I am the marketing and communications director for Simsoc. So we're going to do a game called How was in the Peace Game. So this game will help us to assess whether we have completely lost our Zimbabwean identity in this foreign land. But I'm sure most of you still have that Zimba spirit in you. So our theme for this year is changing the narrative and we're here to remind everyone that our country is beautiful and we love it and we'll continue working towards making it better no matter where we are we must not give up so this is one of the peoples of this game it will also help us to cool off and engage before the discussion begins i will read out loud the questions and leave out five seconds apart from each question and for people and people can type in their answers in the chat room. At the end of the questions, I'll announce the winner who is the person who gets the most correct answers. Mungai will be monitoring the chat room and seeing the person who answers the most correct answers. And this person will get a shout out on our Instagram page and Facebook page. So if anyone is not clear about the, how the game will work, you can type in the chat room or raise a, your hand and someone will unmute you and you can ask your questions. So I'll wait a few seconds just in case someone has a question. Okay, it seems that no one has a question. So I will begin. So just type in your answer in the chat room. So the first question is, what is a traditional healer called in either Shona or Ndevele? The second question is, what is the capital city of Zimbabwe? What is the most popular site to visit in Zimbabwe?
on what day did Zimbabwe become its own country? Okay, we'll go on to the next question. What is the currency used currently in Zimbabwe? Thank you very much, Tatenda, for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are delighted and honored to host our highly esteemed guest, who is a University of Cape Town alumnus with a degree in civil engineering and a master of business administration. He is also an alumnus of Harvard Business School's graduate management program. Prior to joining MTN Group, he was the chief executive officer of Old Mutual Emerging Market, a business that provided financial services to individuals and corporates across 19 countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, managing over 1 trillion rands of customer assets at the time. He then moved and served as the MTN Group's Chief Finance Officer in 2017, and most recently got elected in 2020 as the MTN Group CEO and President. He leads the ninth largest network operator in the world and the largest in Africa, active in more than 20 countries. I present to you Mr. Ralph Mupita. Sia Kwamukela, Sinobuchinga Minzai. Welcome to our very first University of Cape Town Zimbabwe Student Society alumni event. It is a pleasure having you here with us today. May you share with us a bit about who Ralph and Peter is, what your upbringing was like in Zimbabwe, which high school you went to, and how all of that shaped you to be the person that you are today. I, was, and I did my A levels at Plumtree where I was head boy there, uh, but I was there, there for two years. And, um, and um, yeah, and then what happens, as I said about accidents, I had a girlfriend who was at, uh, uh, who told me, and at, in my A-level year, my plan was to go to the UK because my brother was already in the UK and I applied to Oxford and I was shortlisted for a scholarship there. But my girlfriend was going to Cape Town, sorry, well, coming to Rhodes. So may I say, hey, the girlfriend's going to Rhodes, why am I going north? So I can't, let's so, go I, down south. so let's go down south. But she never rocked up, you know. Um, she went to some kibbutz in Israel. So that's how I accidentally ended up at UCT because what I did is because I'd cancelled going to the UK, I had no place to go. The girl didn't rock up. So what I did is actually I took a gap year and then I worked um, at a civil engineering company. So that was accidental. And because I worked with them because I knew the people, they knew my headmaster from Plumtree, um, then they gave me a bursary to study. And so again, not too much thought. And then I studied, uh, I had four wonderful years, lived in Leo Marquardt Hall. I'm sure somebody here lives in Leo Marquardt Hall. Um, and um, and yeah, I mean, did my engineering there and I was subordinate Leo Marquardt Hall. I, I became assistant warden as well. So I had a great time. So to your point about, you know, what did that time period from growing up to UCT undergrad teach me a couple of things. Um, one is to um, one is to be uh, you know quite flexible in life. Have a plan, but learn to accept going down a different course. And actually, what one finds out in life a little bit later, and maybe we can talk about it, is that um, you know a plan is just to have a a structure to how you live your life, but you must have maximum flexibility. I always tell people have a plan, 
but have maximum flexibility, uh, even if you're going down that path. So I learned that by the time you know I was leaving, um, you know, kind of uh, UCT. Uh, the other thing is serendipity I talk about, which is um, just being open to possibility. Uh, don't. It's a little bit different from the first point, but I think the the nuance and subtlety is important. Um, is that things can conspire around you, but you need to trust yourself all along, back yourself, even if things are not. Um, and the third thing I learned was, you know, just embracing a lot more diversity. Because growing up in Zimbabwe, it's quite, you know, it's a diverse place. But when I came to UCT, I just met Kenyans. I met, um, you know, all sorts of folk were in my class. So I think real understanding of diversity and how to work with in a diverse thing. Um, and, uh, and and the final point, I think, is just, you know, curiosity, just being, you know, absolutely curious um, and having a frame of mind that even if I think I'm smart, let me work as if I'm the I'm not the smartest person in the room. So learn to listen a lot uh, and um, mingle your ideas with other people's ideas. So, yeah, I'd, I'd argue that those are some of the things I, I learned during that time, kind of reflecting backwards. Mm, okay, um, that actually seems to be a popular reason for people coming down south, the same one that you have. But uh, yes, you did touch on that. And um, yeah, in addition, can you tell us a bit, a bit about your highlights, about your, your time at GCT? as an international student and how did it help you, you know, launch your career? Yeah, look, I mean, I was in, you know, I'm not sure it's the same situation, but I came having done A-levels. I did maths physics and came for A-levels and I was coming to do an under, undergrad uh, engineering degree and having, you know, looking, doing chemist, chem, uh, chemistry 108 or whatever it was, you know, uh, you know, uh, continuum mechanics 205, whatever. Um, the first two years were actually pretty easy. For me, I remember in my chemistry 108 course, um, we had, um, you know, we had whatever it was, three lectures a, a week or four. I spent the year going to uh, probably five lectures the whole year because I said this chemistry has done it. You know, I did A-levels chemistry. Why are they making me repeat, you know, uh, lower six chemistry? So uh, my first year was a lot of fun and uh, I'm sure you guys do it. Uh, now for the first time you're able to drink it, but you don't know how to drink um, or when to stop. So I had, a, I had a bunch of friends. So the, one of the things that I, I think is quite no, uh, with, um, noteworthy is that uh, at orientation week, I, I hang out with like five people. Those five people, um, and uh, sorry, let me wind back a little bit. The first day we are at, U, at UCT in the engineering department, the guy was the dean, it was a guy called John Martin. He, he's, he's late, actually died last year or this year. John Martin died this year. Uh, but he came and he said, there's 100 people here. Um, only 25 of you are going to finish engineering in four years. So me, I think, wow, I'm on a bursary. My parents can't afford to pay this. I better take this thing seriously. But let me find a, a bunch of friends who are like-minded, who will motivate each other to get through this thing, you know, four years and hopefully dean's uh, merit list and what have you. Um, but we 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 worked hard together, but we also played hard together. And we I remember at UCT we would uh, in the first year, um, you know, when we finished technical drawing, we we would literally stop at quarter past uh, three, and we'll go down. Um, uh, I'm sure these these points are on there, but uh, on Main Road there used to be some uh, uh, drinking spot, and we literally would drink from three until like you know just midnight, or, or and we we're literally comatose. So we played hard and worked hard. But we stayed tight and we we kind of worked through first year, second year, uh, third year and fourth year. Um, so one lesson there was just surrounding yourself with like minded people uh, who embodied your same values, but also had a, a spirit de corps that, you know, was helpful because you can't be all work. So we worked and played hard and we motivated each other. And whenever one of us was not doing grades and we also say we also used to say that we are aiming for marks just on 75, when I get a first, there's no point getting 76 because why put the extra effort? It's still a, a first, what it was the first then. So I, 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 that time, what I, one of the lessons was just finding people who are there for you, who want you to succeed and hanging out with them. And um, in my group, there was a Kenyan guy, there was a guy from Tanzania, there was a guy from Botswana, and the two guys from Zimbabwe. So we're a bit of a mixed group, uh, we had fun. 
I was involved um, in leadership roles. Um, so I was involved, um, I was a maths and physics tutor in my first year and second year to earn a little bit of money. I don't know if you guys still do those things that you get paid. We used to get paid like uh, 50 cents for 15 minutes of uh, 101 uh, tutoring. You used to have people would line up behind your door, knock on Leo Markwood, uh, 10th floor, 1001 was my room. So if there's anybody here in 1001, I was there in the very early 90s. So you'd have a long queue and uh, you charge. Uh, and some people came to queue and they were just coming to Ugo, me or whatever it was, but they weren't really interested in the physics. But the leadership roles was, you know, getting involved in, you know, in, in tutoring. As I said, I was, I was sub warden for discipline at, at uh, Marquette. I don't know why discipline was my thing, but then I was also warden. So I, I played leadership roles in the res. But I also started uh, the International Students Organization because I'd been a Zimsoc member, but I didn't enjoy Zimsoc then because it was just a drinking club. And uh, <laughs> you know, with respect, their events mm-hmm. were very limited to drinking and social. There was nothing cultural building each other. So I was there, but nominally involved. Um, but what happened when I was my second year is that um, UCT decided to double the fees for international students. If you came from the rest of Africa, you paid the same fees as South Africans. But for whatever reason, they then said from next year, and, and we went ballistic. So myself, a guy called John Bodilin is now um, uh, in Australia. We decided that we would um, you know, rally the international students from everywhere. Um, and we created what was then called the International Students Organized. If you guys look in the archives, you'll find me with a lot of hair then. Uh, I don't have hair now, but we set up and we fought the university in terms of, you know, increasing the fees. I hear they eventually won, but when they won, I was not at the university anymore. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, academically involved, um, involved in the uh, involved in the university and then also, you know, some leadership roles. So my main leadership role outside, you know, um, uh, was really around leading the international students organization, fighting for the rights of international students. But interestingly, by the time I got to UCT, I did not play a single iota of uh, cricket. I told you earlier that cricket had been my raison d'etre, but the problem was the cricket practice was always between two and five. Two and five as an engineering student, I was doing practicals. So then I just gave up. So that's how you know, people say, hey, we used to remember you're a great cricketer. What happened? And I said, UCT. <laughs> uh, the engineering program didn't work, but yeah, I enjoyed a lot of, uh, I enjoyed the time there, lots of hard work, fun, but I think the important point I'd leave here is the company you keep really matters. Uh, it's not just all about yourself. So yeah, so hopefully that's a useful perspective. Mm, it seems you had a really rounded life, you know, with different facets than during your time at university. Uh, it brings me to my next question, you know, the change from high school to university is really hard for some. And in addition, the transition from university academics to work life can be a daunting one, especially for international students. How does one navigate that and how smooth was it for you? Did you have everything planned out? Uh, that's a brilliant set of questions there because um, I think everybody will have a different experience, uh, you know, going through it. Um, as I mentioned, with the accident of the girlfriend who didn't come, I, I couldn't actually, in my, the year I was meant to start, I couldn't start because I never applied, um, you know. So the benefit of the gap year taught me a lot of things about the work, um, ab- about life, which I'd never had before. Because remember, previously I had parents, I've got, you know, uh, I'm at school. Now you're kind of on your own and you have to kind of think um, and look after yourself. And um, so... The gap year actually was very helpful. Um, if I think about it, it was a time to to kind of almost, um, you know, anticipate the change that was coming. So when I got to UCT, I was actually kind of, you know, I was, I was, I was definitely one year older, but I was actually maybe five, ten years more mature, which was very interesting when I then started hanging around with the with the folk around me. So the university, uh, high school to university transition. Fairly smooth, but I would I would argue that the gap year was helpful. Some of you may have done gap years here, um, so and I could see that people came straight from high school to university, and they were kind of completely, um, you know, overwhelmed by the freedom. 
Um, and freedom can, you know, often people want freedom, but freedom can be very, very dangerous, uh, unbounded. So, um, but you know, we're all different in, in the ways that uh, we work and grow and how we mind it. But that for me, that was fairly smooth, uh, the transition, because I'd worked and I actually knew the value of work. And I also knew the value of managing time. And as I said, I knew I could literally, you know, kind of become a, a crazy guy on Friday, first year, 3.15. And then on Sunday at two o'clock, I was studying again to prepare for the week. So I, I, the transition year helped me with discipline. Then from university to work, it was easy again for me because what happened was uh, my, VAC, my VAC breaks, at least half of them, I had to go up and work. Uh, the company that was that had given me the bursary, a company called Hoiningos, I'm still very close 30 years later with those founders, Chris, uh, uh, Peter Ingalls and, um, and Rick Hall. Um, I still talk to them this day. So they forced me to do work and I still work for free. <laughs> and uh, while I'm working, my, my colleagues said they were drinking and having fun and going on holidays or whatever. So the transition to work actually, again, was, and I would argue that if you can get the opportunity to work, um, if you can work uh, during your, your breaks, it mentally really helps you, um, you know, to kind of, um, you know, move forward. So I might just purely be lucky um, but I didn't have any difficulties. But if I look back, I would say taking work opportunities where you can, even for free, you know, you, it, it pays uh, valuably in, in, in time to come. Okay, um, as a follow-up question, uh, seeing some students are faced with a dilemma after graduating between, you know, continuing their studies and finding a job. For you, it kind of seems uh, easier that, you know, you went on to do VAC work and then went to get a job. Uh, how does one kind of navigate around that? Yeah, look, it's a tricky thing because it depends also on how you see um, your own career and life uh, growth. And I would I would argue that I, I was I was in a, in a bit of a s situation in that um, I'd been um, my bursary was funded by Hoare and Ingalls because my parents couldn't afford it. Um, and they said, you'll come and work for us for four years. So I, I didn't have that, uh, you know, you know, dilemma. And they said, I must, and, and in fact, one of the things, my, the only regret I have of my kind of early professional life is that um, they were quite forceful that I must come and work for another four years. So uh, it, it, it wasn't even a choice. It was, otherwise you pay us back. And I said, oh, geez, I mean, I'm not going to give my parents this headache. Uh, let me just work. It's actually a blessing to, to, to have work. But assuming you don't have that as a condition, I think the first thing is to really think if you've got absolute freedom, I didn't have the freedom because I had commitments, financial commitments, but assuming you have the freedom, the way I would think about it is to say, where do I see myself in three, five and 10 years from today? And knowing full well that the further you go out, the greater the variability of outcomes is not certain. In fact, that path that you think you'll be, you'll be far off it the further you go out. My advice would be think about what career you want to be and, and pivot at the five-year point, not the three-year point and not the 10. Because 10, you, you, life changes completely uh, 10 years out, but because things happen and then you move with them. But what I would uh, suggest is have a vision of where you want to be. And if you're seeing yourself in a much more academic and technical, then it's much easier for you to say, I move from a BS eng, I'm, I'm making it up, BS eng, and immediately to a master's because I'm pursuing a technical route. But if you're pursuing a commercial route, you're going to go to business or whatever, I would leave university as quickly as I can to get some real work experience and then come back and do an MBA or something, which is exactly what I did, is I then came back a few years later and did an MBA. So how you navigate the tr transition from university to, um, you know, to work, you must fashion it on your own personal vision or like what I was, you know, sometimes you're straight jacketed, you, you have financial commitments you can't do, um, but pivot it at year five. Now, what's interesting for me, my pivot for year five was always going to be to do an MBA and then come back as an engineer, contracts engineer. But when I got to the, my MBA year, um, again, accident, is that company, Hoyne Ingalls, did not want to pay for my MBA. And then I had applied and then I was like stuck. And because uh, I, I know my parents couldn't afford it. And I said, you, I'm in, 
I've I've got my G Mat score. I'm in. Now they want this whatever it was, 120,000. So where, where where would I get 120,000 from? You know this young, you know, 20 odd. Uh, but then Old Mutual again, serendipity. Old Mutual phoned. Uh, Old Mutual South Africa phoned and said, Hey, we have seen your grades. We have seen your thing. Um, uh, would you take a bursary from us as well? And I asked them, you know, so for what? And they said, no, you just come and work for us for one year. So you study one year MBA. Um, and um, so I tell that story coming from the point of view that I'd always seen myself doing an MBA because I wanted to be much broader business. I didn't want to be too technical. Um, I like different things. I like problem solving, but I like different kinds of problems to solve. Uh, so my five year points, I, I basically hit it. Uh, in that the MBA would allow me to pivot and give me greater opportunities going forward. But my advice to the folk on the platform is try and have that vision five years out. Uh, it might not be perfect, but it at least it gives you a roadmap and it gives you discipline. Mm, okay, um, that sounds good. Uh, it seems you're blessed a couple of times, you know, in several ways. Exactly. Uh, many. Many people say that uh, one encounters a lot of opportunities while studying at university. Uh, how did you make use of the different resources like career services that UCT provided? And to what extent did networking in the university and also in the workplace contribute to your larger success? Yeah, another great set of questions. I, I, I'm not sure I used the resources. Now I look back, I don't think I used the resources as well at university. Um, you know, um, and as I reflect, I'm not sure why I didn't. Um, maybe I was just like working flat out, trying to get decent grades. And uh, when I have a moment to, you know, to breathe, you know, you know you, like a typical student, you want to have a party or, or uh, just relax a bit. Um, but the thing that I, I I would reflect on is the network, is to build a powerful network of relationships. And I think as you guys get older, you realize actually it's not what you know that then becomes important as you rise up organizations or you rise up in your career you do need the a, a foundation of content uh, or some expertise whatever it is it can be from drama it can be to engineering it can be medicine whatever you need a foundation but that foundation is not enough um, and part of it um, is 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 you know is is really thinking about um, is is really thinking about the network to, to get the skills of building networks. So as I mentioned, I had my core team of five or so uh, friends who we, we went through university with. But outside that core, I started building, you know, bridges into different uh, areas of, and, and, and folk that I, I, I'm still friends with. Just people who think differently from you. So as an engineer, spend time with people who are in drama, okay? Uh, or spend time with people who are in just almost the opposite of where you are. And But the one thing I learned there that I think now looking back was very helpful, there was a program called PCU, Professional Communications Unit. I don't know if it still exists on mid-campus. Because uh, Yeah, so I was doing all these technical, and then I had this aha moment when I was in uh, my third year about the importance of communication, i.e., if you've got great ideas and they stay in your head, that's very, it's useless. You need to learn the skill of being able to really think out uh, how do you deliver messages in ways that those messages are received. And communication is a two-way thing, which is also you need to understand how you're being received. And I remember, I can't remember the professor's name, wasn't even probably a professor, doctor, somebody at the PCU. And... People used to say, Ralph, you're spending too much time on this PCU thing. I said, no, I think this thing is going to be important. So to your question on resources, the one thing I overdid, I think, was the PCU uh, thing. And I did it electively. I didn't have to do it. And I look back because I'd done, you know, public speaking. I'd done Toastmasters. Now I, I brought in PCU. That, I think, was an absolute game changer because it taught me to simplify um to, to reduce everything to the essence. No matter how complex anything is, it has features of essence. And to work with those essence in trying to explain things and communicate. So yeah. that resource, PCU, I really think I got good value. But I must say I, I was probably not so great at uh, 
leveraging uh, you know much of the resource that there was, uh, um, um, and maybe part of it was just uh, it, part of it must have also been ignorant. You know, I was just this Zimbabwean kid um, with a with a year of a gap year, but didn't know too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do concur with you on that one. You know, like being able to be a good communicator is important in whatever role that you'll be in, because it's highly likely you'll be working in teams and stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, moving to my next question, you know, your, your first degree was in civil engineering, and then you did an MBA, and then, you know, you started working off as an engineer due to your bursary, and then later on, you became the CEO of Old Mutual Emerging Markets mm -hmm. in the financial services industry. You then proceeded to become the CE CFO of MTN Group in the telecoms industry, and now you're it's CEO. Mm. Has that always been the plan? Uh, given the unconventional nature of the career path you took, how did you switch industries to broaden your skill set? Was it an easy decision altogether? You know, if you asked me seven years ago, would I be sitting here? I, I, I don't think I would have said so. But I think when I joined the dots back, and I think it's, it's another message I tell young people is that a lot of, you know, Although you plan looking forward, things make sense looking backwards. Um, so I started off as an engineering uh, because I, you know, as I said, I like maths and physics. I like maths, physics, and chemistry. It was just like it came naturally to me. So I enjoyed things that I have to. And I didn't explicitly go to choose civil engineering because I said I want to be a civil engineer. I chose civil engineering because um, I like problem solving. Okay, I could have done chemeng, I could have done electrical eng. I was just interested in problem solving. I loved problem solving, playing around with things. So the one thing that has anchored me right through different career transition that is consistent is problem solving. Uh, um, and so that has nothing to do with a particular industry. But I, I can only make that statement looking backwards, not by looking forward, because I started off as an engineer and then my pivot from engineering to finance again, is completely accidental. It's a function of, you know, old mutual came with the bursary. I did not go to MBA with the plan of going to financial first services. Old mutual rocked up and said, hey, come work for us. And that's why I say, just be open to possibility in your life. And, um, you know, people say serendipity is the word. So I did not have a conscious plan of being a civil engineer, but I made it work for me. Then I have a pivot to MBA and old mutual rocks up and I pivot in the direction of finance. Um, and then within Old Mutual, actually, I mean, I did like six different careers over 17 years. Yeah, until I, I headed up the, the emerging markets unit that uh, in 2012, um, you know, they made me head of uh, emerging markets, the biggest unit in Old Mutual then. Um, and I was 39 years old. So the, the interesting thing there is uh, the thread, without going through all the detail, First is problem solving, um, and I, you know, a bit of serendipity got me everywhere. So, from from civil engineering to financial services, there was a pivot of the MBA and a bunch of serendipity type conditions that got me into financial services. When I got to financial mm -hmm. services, um, and after I'd been five years CEO of all mutual emerging markets, with respect, I got a little bit tired because. It felt like I knew everything in the company. But, you know, after 17 years, maybe you should know everything or most things. But I got a call from Tuman Tleko, who was then exec chair in 2016, to say, hey, come over. And I said, to do what? You know, I'm in financial services. Do you want to do a partnership with us at all? He said, no, no, I want you to join us. And I said, to do what? He said, no, I want you to be a CFO. And I said, geez, I've never been a CFO. I mean, I don't know any accounting. I don't know IFRS 16 and all of that stuff. He said, no, 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 but you... you you, you, you're, you're mathematically oriented and, and, and so forth. So I went home, you know, spoke to my wife and I said, yo, this guy is crazy, man. What's, what's he talking about? You know, the largest mobile network operator. I know nothing about the sector. Uh, or I know very superficially. I, I even know less about finance. I know a good CFO when I see one, but I can't be one. But anyway, I slept over. The next day I said yes. So, um, so beyond the, the problem solving, the other thing that I, I would encourage people um, is to to kind of back yourself, um, but back yourself with a pretty deterministic way of getting on top of 
the new environments you're in. Because I wouldn't I wouldn't advise many people to do what I did, which is go into a new sector that you have no tech uh, expertise on, uh, technical expertise, and go into a role that you've never been, like a CFO for a listed company, you know, all of that. But I think the other thing of backing yourselves and having the, the ability to build strong teams and understand what good looks like, um, you know, um, you know, have helped me. But I, I mean, I can only look at that kind of joining the dots backwards. But also, I also I, I also encourage people to be braver than they think. You are always more talented than you think you are. Um, and often people are second guessing. Now, people don't get offended by by this. But, you know, I find men generally can leap into situations that are they are 30 percent ready for. I find women will leap into a situation where they're 90 percent. So um, I encourage more women to take risks. Uh, the women will walk, walk around because I know that they'll make it. And I would encourage people to not wait for the perfect answer before you move. So it, my career has been highly unusual. Um, you know, as some of my friends say, they, they wouldn't encourage people to do what I do. But I, I, there are many people who have done better than I've done. So uh, if I can do it, a boy from Mutare, uh, he, all of you guys can do it. Huh? Mutare is a small place still, huh? <laughs> yeah, Christmas pass. <laughs> yeah, Christmas pass. There you go. Yeah, um, I like the way we're just encouraging women. Yeah, that's very important. And um, yeah, you did mention a lot of, you know, problem solving in there. Urban legend has it that if you've done engineering, you can do anything. Uh, how far true is this? given the several awards you have won in the different industries, and what skills did the engineering equip you with? I don't know if there's absolute truth to the fact that if you do engineering, you can do anything. Um, but I come back to this problem-solving thing. Um, what engineering really teaches you, because that's the only subject I studied deeply. So whether it's electrical chemistry, the one common thread there is is there is tons of problem solving. Um, um, and, you know, it, it, problem solving, actually problems are, problems can be constructed very differently. And, you know, you start off thinking um, the indeterminate type problems that have got multiple variables. I'm coming back into your guys' world. Some of you guys here know how to solve multivariable equations. But if you strip out from all that detail, the thing that you learn is how do you tackle a problem? And sometimes people get overwhelmed by a problem. I would say a problem can always be fixed by, uh, solved by starting by fixing several variables. So if I start with the assumption that this thing that looks very complex, here's where I need to start if I want to get an answer. That's what engineering teaches you, which I think is consistent. Uh, and it's quite a generic school that you can use in every, uh, or in different situations. It's certainly in my life, and this, my life is not a perfect one. That's one thing that I've learned is when I work with teams, the thing I, that strikes me is that people often have difficulties in looking at a complex situation and say, where do I start here? So engineering actually, you know, does, uh, but you know, whether it's, you can, you, you can work in an industry, I'm not so sure, but it does give you the base of thinking about where do I start? Because where you start with solving a problem often determines the answer you get. If you start at the wrong place, like if you start in the wrong direction on a road, you'll end up somewhere else that you didn't intend. So I would argue that that is, 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 is something that I would tick a box and say that that for sure is true. But I, I wouldn't say that it means um, it, you can do anything. I'm, I'm not sure an engineer can be an actor, uh, <laughs> but maybe they can. Yeah. Maybe they can. Yeah. Um, from one president to another, though we manage significantly <laughs> different portfolios, <laughs> uh, uh, how is it like being the president and CEO of a large group of companies with over 10 billion United States dollars in revenue, what do you enjoy the most and what intrigues you about this role? In addition, uh, what challenges do you encounter and how do you juggle and balance the different responsibilities that you have uh, also as a father, a friend to some? Yeah, look, I mean, um, it's an absolute pleasure to work at MTN because you know that the work that you're doing is having an impact. So I guess one of the things that I, I was going to say at the end, but I, I might as well say now, is that one of the things uh, I've been focused on is working for purpose-led organizations. Um, and that, that, that purpose must resonate with who you are. Uh, 
and the purpose of MTN is uh, we talk about it internally uh, uh, that we believe that everybody deserves the benefits of a modern connected life. And the modern connected life is digital inclusion, financial inclusion. Um, so with the complexity of the issues that I deal with, knowing that purpose, you know, it keeps me grounded and and, uh, and uh, focused. Yeah, look, it's MTN is a complex business. We have two, just uh, about 278 million subscribers, uh, our customers. So we probably, you know, the largest consumer business on the African continent by some distance, as you said, the ninth biggest telco. But if you strip out the chi China and India, we're probably the fourth biggest telco in the world uh, wow. in terms of subscribers. So we we operate in 21 markets. So I spend a lot of time, well, pre-COVID, I spent a lot of time in Iran. So we're in Iran, we're in Syria, we're in Yemen, we're in Afghanistan. We, we are exiting those markets. And then we have 17 markets across Africa. Uh, unfortunately, MTN is not in Zimbabwe, but uh, we're pretty much, you know, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, stuff, et cetera. So yeah, it's a it's an honor and a privilege to be president of the, of a company where it's you are touching so many lives and impacting so many lives. Yeah, it comes with this challenge as well. It's not all smooth. They often we have difficulties coming back to my problem solving. You know, I'm kind of as somebody said, you're attracted to problems. But um, yeah, I, I I I lead the company with the um, with uh, with firstly you know, a, 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 a sense of clarity about where I think the company needs to go. You know, that's what we call mm -hmm. strategy. And, you know, you know, what do we want to do with the company for the next five years? You know, the, the, the famous five years coming into effect as well. Um, I've, I've a, I'm a team player, so I look at my team and I try and hire people who are cleverer than me. I always look at my exco and I say, when you lead, make sure everybody else in your team is smarter than you in in their area their domain expertise what you bring is the ability as a leader to link everybody up and to and and uh, and i'm and i'm sure you're used to that as well but when you pick a team pick the very smartest for the domain so finance get the best uh, and, and and so forth what do i enjoy um i enjoy i enjoy the fact we, i enjoy traveling i mean on tuesday was in monday i was in uh, i'm here in january now so I was in Rwanda, met up with President Kigame. We were meant to meet for 30 minutes. Um, you know, we ended up having almost an hour and a half talking about Africa, Pan-Africanism. Where do we take this continent? So I like, I, I enjoy the, the part of my job, which is about the nation state. You know, how do we, I'm a passionate Pan-African. Um, you know, having grown up uh, on the continent, uh, although I've you know, kind of worked you know, pretty extensively across different markets, I'm a deep believer and in, in, in this continent as people and that you know, this continent will, will get to its pride of place. So I like to travel. I like to go to Nigeria, Ghana and all sorts. So the travel is, is, is um, but then the thing that really you know, gets underneath my skin is the sense of progress you see, you know, financial inclusion. We built a mobile money business which is the biggest on the African continent, providing financial services to people who never ordinarily have found financial services. And then also, you know, digital inclusion. You know, you and I have access to the internet. I mean, I don't know if you guys know, but yeah. only one third of Africans have access to the internet, 400 million. The other 800 million don't know what WhatsApp is. So we've got a big job as MTN, and, 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 and that really encourages us to do the work that we do. And I, and I love the work that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a comment in the comment section saying, do bring MTN to Zimbabwe. <laughs> so people are probably anticipating that. Somebody must, for, if they phone us to say, please, can you come like the Ethiopians? We, um, we just put a bid for a telco license in Ethiopia. We'll find out if we win. But, um, you know, I always say to people, it's strange, you know, my home country, nobody's phoned us to say, please come, you know. But anyway, maybe the call will come. Yeah, we hope that. Um, considering your footprint in several countries in Africa and partially in the Middle East, uh, what has been your experience with diversity and how have you embraced it for it to work for you? Uh, what can students expect and how should they equip themselves in culturally, linguistically and racially diverse environments? What challenges and lessons have you gained along the way? Uh, super important point, which I think in your guys' career, um, in your lifetime is going to become a lot more 
important. Um, I have a story and a joke at home, um, or at least my friends who say, I got four kids, but and um, between 16 and 10, and they all do Mandarin. <laughs> and I told them, you can learn any, you can drop French and Spanish if you like, but you will learn ma Mandarin um, because in the world that you live in, uh, you need to be able to integrate. But coming back to the your question about diversity, as I mentioned, one of the things that was that I was that struck me is when I got to university is building this coalition of very close friends. You know, as I mentioned, Tanzania, Kenya, Botswana, uh, etc. That that was the opening for me around the idea of diversity and and that diversity brings strength. Um, I, I I would position out that the more diverse the more resilience you have in your system. Because Chris, if you and I are the same, and we fill a, a table with, with Ralphs and Chris's, what's the point of the table? Because you're getting the same. So I think diversity is important. And, and so my encouragement to people is build networks of people who are different from you. Even if they look like you, um, you know, find people who are different in their outlook. And start on the basis of firstly accepting your views, that you're comfortable with your views, but you're comfortable that other people have views different from you because the, the 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 start of really building diversity is a groundedness of sense of self but an acceptance that people can be different but that can all that can coexist harmoniously often we find in the world that chris if i don't like you now i want to hurt you or whatever that becomes a zero sum game so the first thing with with, with building strength and diversity is 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 a self understanding and being comfortable with self, but also accepting that others are different and it's okay. And you can learn things between different cultures. And uh, and I guess one of my most fascinating stories is traveling to Iran. Um, and I don't know if anybody has been to Tehran. Uh, the media is very, the Western media in particular is very unfair on, on Iran. I've been traveling there for about three, four years. And just those people feel like me, they, they feel like Shona people, you know? So um, before you engage people, always start with the view that, you know, people are start from a place of good. But on the diversity and inclusion thing, I think it's going to become a, more, a lot more important going forward uh, in terms of skills, in terms of race, um, in terms of gender, uh, in terms of geography. And I would encourage all of you to, to start nurturing, if you haven't already, the skills that allow people to be attracted to you because you're open to people who are different to you. Because people can see very clearly um, that, you know, you may have red lines, you don't want people to come across. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, it also helps you deal with the situations where things can be tough. And, you know, I've lived here for, you know, pretty much three decades. Um, and it, it hasn't always been easy. And, you know, being from Zimbabwe, um, and, you know, having, you know, progressed career wise here, yeah, it attracts its own problems sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. So, yeah, I've been, you know, but what has helped me to be resilient to some of those challenges, whether, you know, sporadic xenophobic things happen to me, I mean, it has happened to me, I'm not perfect. I mean, I, I wouldn't say there's many, but there, uh, there have been instances, you know, um, there's also, you know, blatant racism in careers. And people, you guys would think maybe, because of the stations I'm in, uh, I don't experience it. You know, I, I do experience it. Some of it is subtle. Uh, as my daughter says, it's called microaggressions, daddy. So um, you do meet challenges like that. But if you're resilient in your own core, you can withstand that. And, um, and you know, uh, I've lived in South Africa for 30 years. I'm proudly, you know, born in Zimbabwe. I, I have no shame in that. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, it, it gives me a strength and a resonance when I think about where I come from, in fact, where I come from is deep in the rural areas in the in the eastern islands called Rupinda. When I think about where I come from, it grounds me and it allows me to deal with shocks to my you know sense of diversity. But I would encourage all of you to reflect on those things and think about how do you build resilience that enables you to be an an attractor for people who are diverse, uh, you know, from you. Okay. Ah, oh, that's an amazing piece of advice. Uh, wrapping this up before we jump into the quick Q&A, our theme for this year as the UCT Zimstock is changing the narrative, hashtag take action. Mm -hmm. As we are in Africa month, how can the youth contribute to building a better tomorrow for Zimbabwe and for Africa as a whole? 
I think the youth need to take charge of the future of Africa. I mean, you, you can take one of two uh, stances. The one is, hey, we're waiting for the elders to solve all the problems. You know, the presidents, the prime ministers of Africa, etc. You guys figure it out. We're waiting for you to give us the answers. Okay, that's approach number one. There's an approach number two is we're taking the matter into our own hands. Okay, and because this is our future, we're going to be here. You guys are going to be working the next 30, 40 years still ahead for you. You know, maybe I've got 10 years and then I'm going to go sit at uh, some farm in Vumba or whatever. But the, 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 the second option is what I would encourage you in Africa Month to think about as the youth is how do we take control? And control is not only about voting or being in government, but to create the Africa we want to see, an Africa that is progressive, an Africa that does not leave anybody behind, an Africa that leads in innovation and creating um, kind of new potentiality. Um, nothing stops you guys from doing that. You don't have any handcuffs that stops you. So why aren't you guys thinking about, you know, where the next Silicon Valley will, will come from? Maybe it's in Cape Town, you know, maybe it's in, in Rua outside of um, Harare. Why are we self-limiting? And my sense is that if I was back, um, not although not um, Try, not trying to avoid the question of, you know, how do you think about it? But my, my, my view is you've got to take the matter into your own hands uh, in the situations and places where you are to be able to say we will drive our own futures. And it starts with the first person and the second, the third, etc. And it, it has a catalytic effect over time is in your generation is it's much easier to be able to start something new. So I'll be encouraging you guys to be much more entrepreneurial, thinking about the solutions that will uh, create a more prosperous Africa. So I was in Rwanda on um, Monday, Tuesday, I came back uh, Tuesday night. And one of the things I saw, they called, it's called a zip liner, but what, what it is, it's a, a blood transfusion um, system where they're able to, out of Kigali, send drones, okay, uh, to deliver blood in the rural areas. The drone has the coordinates, it knows where it's going, and it has an MTN chip, uh, you know, which is obviously uh, linked to our base station so that, you know, it knows where it's going. Um, so it's it's a solution that's solving a real African problem. People in the rural areas don't get uh, blood transfusion. People die because they get blood six days later. This thing can get blood across, um, you know, Rwanda in um, in most reasonably near places, Kigali and elsewhere, uh, it may be in an hour. Uh, think six days, two days, an hour. So I use that zipline example to say somebody sat, a young person sat and thought about that as, I think I can build this thing because it's an African solution. Huh? So my challenge in, yeah. in, in, in Africa Month is to say in the space that I'm in, the domain expertise, if I'm yeah. artist, how am I going to create content that's relevant for Africa? Uh, because it's not going to be made by some guy sitting in America, to be honest, because they don't really know your conditions. If I'm an engineer, do I build the next zip line? So, so, uh, so I would challenge you guys to think about that. I mean, I use Africa Day to really think about um, where we've come from. I, I'm also a fan of history, so I've I've studied the Monomotapa Empire. Mm -hmm. I know as a Mupita, my totem is Makombe. The Makombes used to be the advisors to Monomotapa in about 1600. And when you when you study history, it's another thing that helps you study history. You know where you come from. It gives you a very strong anchoring on who you are. And I think also on on your view on the continent, which, as I said, me, I'm a, I, I, I love this continent and uh, it's difficult. It's not the easiest place, but these are my people. I've got nowhere to go because this is home, you know, so I uh, really like it. Yeah. All right, I definitely love the passion that you have for both Zimbabwe and Africa as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can definitely say uh, making good strides, you know, in making Africa a better place for all. Uh, so we're just going to go quickly through some Q&A uh, questions, some which were asked before the event and some during the chat. Sure. Uh, so yeah, the first question was, um, how was the rapid change management and adapt adaptation process what efforts have been put in place to allow a smoother implementation of change 
considering we're at the brink of the fourth industrial revolution, how can students equip themselves for the future of work? Yeah, the future of work is an interesting place. And I would say, coming back to what I've learned looking back, is you need to learn, you need to create as, as a part of your own personal resilience, the ability to learn and unlearn. Um, you know, one of these things you asked, and, and I, I can only look at it looking backwards, is you moved from engineering, you went to finance, you went to telecommunications, you know, you even went to a different area like managing a, um, to being a CFO, is I think you need to, the skills of the future, the, the core spine, the skills of the future are about learning and unlearning. So today, somebody will say to you, going forward into the future, you need to learn about machine learning, AI. You need to be more creative. The creatives have a bigger place in the future than they today, in, in my humble opinion. Um, so the skills are going to change. There are jobs in five years time that, uh, that are going to form 10, 15 percent of the economy that don't exist today. So you, you can't prepare for something. It's the content of something that doesn't exist today, but you can prepare for it by having the personal resilience and the mindset and framing that says, I need to have the capacity to learn and unlearn. You must be continuously learning. I would argue that that is the thread that is consistent for anybody who's going to succeed in the future, even without knowing what the future will exactly bring forward. But your brain needs to be ready and, and uh, or your mind uh, needs to be ready uh, for that kind of dexterity and flexibility to learn and unlearn. Mm, okay, definitely. Uh, the next question is, in the heat of the pandemic, while other businesses were crashing and filing for bankruptcy, you were elected uh, in the contrary. Uh, so you were elected and in contrary, you managed to grow the business even more. What is your secret source as a leader and as a business? I don't think there's a secret source to anything. Everything is about hard work and uh, and also uh, getting lucky a little bit. Um, yeah, we're in an industry that is primed for the situation we're in right now, which is, um, you know, lockdowns and um, spatial distancing. Um, and as a function of that, people are are carrying on with their lives, you know, with you know, by, by relying on connectivity. So we have been, you know, a massive beneficiary of the lockdown uh, arrangements, but that will pass. Um, and but before COVID came, we were beginning to see an acceleration of the so-called fourth industrial revol uh, revolution where technology was evolving at a rapid pace. And we're going through different stages of technological evolution, 3G, 4G, and then now with the cusp of 5G, which is a massive leap. I mean, 5G is not even about your phone. 5G is really a story about uh, you know, industrialization so-called industrial IoT, the Internet of Things, millions and millions of devices connected that are giving you data and and uh, and so forth. And as a function of that, you know, actions being driven. So, yes, the industry sat in a very nice place. Um, basically, the digital acceleration we thought would happen in five years happened in a year. Uh, and many of the changes that have come, e-commerce and what have you, won't change, won't revert back because people are used to shopping online, getting their groceries online, why do they have to go to Checkers or Willies or whatever? Um, but yes, we've had a tailwind, but we've had to put a st strategy, which you guys can go on the website that uh, to see, which we call Ambition 2025, five years out, the, the power of five years out, just think about that, um, is we built a strategy uh, at MTN that we think takes advantage of our skills, our brand, uh, and position in our markets. So it's not just luck. You have to sometimes create your own luck as well. So, yeah, I mean, I would argue that, um, yeah, we've had some progress, but I'm not satisfied. We are a million miles away from where MTN deserves to be. So, you know, I'll only talk about success maybe five years from today. Right now, we've got a lot of work to do. It's definitely amazing how you've got uh, foresight and are always looking ahead. Uh, because we're running a bit short of time, I'll ask the last Q&A question, which is, yeah. Success often requires sacrifice. What advice uh, do you give to some people trying to make it at the top? What do you think has been the key factor and characteristics or attributes behind your success? Yeah, look, I don't see myself as being successful yet. I mean, I think I'm a work in progress, firstly. 
uh, because you're never you're never the finished product. There's always things you can do better. So uh, I was at that mindset actually as you know as a young person that wherever you are, you 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 can improve. And and there's an important wiring that I think as a person one needs, which is don't compete with others, compete with yourself, because you know your true potential. Because I, I you know I always tell people if you can run the hundred meter race in eleven seconds. Um, but you run it in 12 and still come number one, that's not the best you can do. You've got to push yourself. Um, so I think I would argue that the first thing is is, is, is know thyself. Uh, and, and knowing thyself helps you to know where your limits are. Come back to this, uh, coming back to this 11 seconds for the 100 meters thing. What is your true uh, potential and capacity? Um, have a vision of where you want to go to. As I said, put put a put a three five, 10 year marker, uh, but knowing that you're in a pivot to the five and back yourself and be comfortable with uncertainty. Accept uncertainty. I'm going to start walking a path. When you walk in a forest, you don't even know 100% exactly where you're going to go. So why should in your career expect to know everything in advance? Um, so just back yourself, take some risks, um, but take calculated risks. If something doesn't work, you come back and you move forward, um, have a level of content expertise uh, at some level, but have skills that can be enduring. As I said, you know, the, the thing I would say is that problem solving is the thread through my, my career so far. Tick the box. What is the other thread? Being open to serendipity for different events, but it's a wiring of the mind that you know, if somebody comes to you and says, you want to be a CFO, I don't say, well, I've never done accounting. I don't have an accounting degree uh, or anything. I back myself to ultimately get there. So, and um, and I, I would suggest something that I hope some of you guys do is be deeply reflective or meditative. Um, because reflections, personal reflections can really help you see you the way you really are. So that you're not lying to yourself about who you are and what, because that clarity is super helpful as you navigate and 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 uh, and and, and uh, you know you know take advantage of the opportunities you guys will face. You guys are going to face more opportunities, and you guys will be more successful than I've been, uh, yeah, or relatively um, in my career. But yeah, just wishing you guys all the best, and hopefully we'll be able to meet uh, up face to face when COVID is behind and. Uh, uh, you know, find a way to return to UCT. Uh, been seeing the pictures uh, from a distance of the fire uh, and how the fire leapt Snape Building. I spent four years at Snape Building and got to the Jagger Library. Just I was I was really, yeah, really upset with what we what I saw. But uh, you guys are right yeah, there yeah. in the thick of things. But uh, yeah, Chris has been great to be on the platform. Hopefully, it's been useful for uh, your your colleagues and uh, wish you guys abundance and success going forward. Nah, thank you. We have definitely gained a lot from this interview and all the words of wisdom you have shared with us today. Uh, I'm sure I'm not only speaking for myself when I say that uh, we are truly inspired by the work that you do and continue to do in uplifting Africa. It's rather unfortunate uh, that the event is online. We would have loved to take you around to explore the mother city again. Yeah. Um, this brings us to the end of our interview and Q&A session. Uh, I'll hand it over to Michelle to give a vote of thanks and closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, good evening again. Uh, I would like to first of all thank Mr. Ralph Mupita for taking time out of his busy schedule and gracing us with his presence. This has been truly inspiring and encouraging. Uh, we have managed to engage and learn from Mr. Peter how to navigate as an international student in and out of UCT and how to succeed in the world outside of university. On my side, I'm taking from him the idea of being able to learn and unlearn, having a plan but being flexible enough to leave that plan, trusting yourself, being curious, embracing diversity, having a vision, building a diverse network and being open to possibility and finding like-minded people. I would like to also thank the committee for making this event a success through their hard 
work and diligence from the president Chris and to the vice president and everyone who has been doing background work to make this event run smoothly. We all worked hard and I'm glad that this event was a success. I also want to extend a vote of thanks to Helen and Kabilu from the MTN group to help us to make sure that this discussion was up to our maximum benefit. Special thanks also gets, goes to the UCT alumni and the IAPO team for me, helping us market the event and making sure that as many, many people benefit from this event. This brings us to the end of this event. Which Thank has been a success. And we look forward to you and our more future events. I want to thank you all for coming. Maita Mawia Matifaza. If you have any questions with regards to this event, suggestions for future events, or any query, you can reach us on our social media platforms or email us at uct. Dot at my uct. Dot, okay, sorry for that. At uctzimsoc at myuct.ac.za. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for coming. Maita Basa. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.